This lecture is on the age of exploration. Usually we associate the age of exploration with the 16th century, the 1500s. For United States history, we can think of the age of exploration as roughly beginning with the journeys of Columbus to the New World, beginning in 1492, and perhaps ending in 1607 with the English colonization of Jamestown. For European history, we might think of the age of exploration as a little longer than that. But in any case, this is the great century of Europeans leaving their continent, which they had been familiar with for so long, and starting to branch out and discover other worlds and other destinations. There were many causes for the age of exploration. Probably the best ones we can uh, associate with the age of exploration would include religious zeal. So for the first time, missionaries looking to move beyond European boundaries and head out to previously undiscovered lands uh, to spread their denomination of Christianity. So this would include Roman Catholic missionaries, particularly Jesuits, looking to get to new lands before the Protestants arrived, and then also early Protestant missionaries also going to new lands. There's also the many stories of fantastical lands, these exotic lands that are out there, perhaps undiscovered worlds that Europeans are looking to find for the first time. Legends about the city of El Dorado, a city made of gold, or perhaps Atlantis, an underwater kingdom in between Europe and the New World. So all these myths and stories about incalculable riches or uh, mermaids, sea monsters, all these things kind of fuel the adventurous spirit of Europeans in the 16th century. And then, of course, there are economic motives in a desire uh, to increase the national treasury through the discovery of new deposits of gold, silver, and precious metals. So an easy way to remember these motivations or causes for expansion could be God, glory, and gold, three major motivations for the age of exploration. One of the earliest European explorers actually doesn't go to the New World, what we would call North and South America, but rather goes in the opposite direction, goes east. This is Marco Polo from uh, the Italian peninsula. He's an Italian explorer. And for centuries, Europeans had a very small trade with the Far East, with China, uh, over the Silk Road. Uh, silk worms producing silk in China would make their way a very long journey, thousands of miles, all the way to Europe with a small number of products. Marco Polo is one of the first to actually follow that route back and head out all the way to China. He actually meets the Kublai Khan uh, in charge of the Mongol Empire. And uh, his stories really spread the desire among Europeans to look beyond their borders and see what is uh, part of the larger world. Exploration is always accompanied by technological development, and there are several items that Europeans develop leading up to the age of exploration that are going to make the age of exploration possible. These would include better maps. Previous to this, you had a lot of flat maps, which are of course useless for uh, identifying long distances. They really ignore the curvature of the earth, so they are highly inaccurate. Gradually, Europeans are able to develop what are called portolani, or uh, these medieval charts that were much more accurate and much more detailed. They include things like coastal contours, um, exactly uh, where ports were in inlets and isthmuses and peninsulas, also identified tides, distances between ports, and also compass readings. The early Greek astronomer Ptolemy inspired other cartographers or map makers to come along and also develop more accurate maps. So of course these today look pretty inaccurate to us, but compared to what had come before it, these maps are actually more advanced and had a better understanding of uh, important navigation uh, data that was important for sailors and explorers heading out uh, away from Europe. Among the technological developments that were important for the coming of the Age of Discovery had a lot to do with sailing and navigators. 
So in regards to ships and sailing, we have the development of the axial rudder, which is a smaller rudder that helps ships steer more finely and with greater accuracy, particularly in very narrow uh, inlets and waterways. Uh, square rigging of lateen sails. Lateen sails are very small sails on the front of a ship, on the bow of a ship, which again uh, enabled uh, more accurate direction uh, into narrow spaces. The development of the Spanish Caravel. Caravel was a very significant ship developed by Spain which had uh, a low draft to it. In other words, it didn't sink very far into the water. It was a large ship that you could put large guns on and carry a lot of cargo, uh, but yet it didn't sink deep into the water. So therefore it could go closer to land and into natural harbors uh, wherever the captain was looking to maneuver it. Uh, you also have the development of the compass, which is important for direction, also the astrolabe, uh, and also a better knowledge of western winds. And with this greater knowledge of winds and tides and coastal patterns and so forth, this enables cartographers to develop better maps and for captains to sh sail their ships in areas uh, that were previously unknown. So here are some of the features of the caravel uh, that were valuable, again, that enabled it to carry a lot of cargo, large guns, but also a lot of different sails, and be much more fine in its direction with a new rudder and those lateen sails, uh, those small triangle sails up front, enabling better direction. Some of the earliest explorers came from the European coastal country of Portugal. Uh, the Portuguese are kind of at the head of a lot of the Age of Discovery. That would include Bartolomeu Diaz, who in 1487 left Lisbon, capital of Portugal, and sailed down the African coast. No one in recent memory had gone that far south. And his journey is significant because he makes it all the way to the Cape of uh, Good Hope, what we would call South Africa today. He doesn't round the tip of Africa, the Cape of Good Hope. But he does provide better maps, establishes some Portuguese trading colonies, uh, makes contact with local natives and so forth, bring back, uh, brings back goods, and whets the appetite of other countrymen to continue the journey. So one of these that continues the journeys of Diaz is Vasco da Gama, another Portuguese explorer who not only goes down the west coast of Africa, but he actually does round the Cape of Good Hope and goes up the east side of Africa, again, establishing trading ports, spots, um, conducting trade with some of the local natives, and then it actually crosses the Indian Ocean and makes it all the way to India. So it's the Portuguese that are first to establish some trading ports uh, in on the Indian subcontinent. So you can see from this map that the Portuguese are actually pretty far advance far ahead of a lot of other nations in establishing colonies and trading spots around the world. We often think of the age of exploration as having to do so much with the Spanish, but in reality it's the Portuguese that are first to establish a lot of important ports and really focus the attention of Europeans a bit more towards the east and the far east uh, than what was to come. It is of course the Italian sea captain Christopher Columbus that will earn quite a name for himself uh, for his significant accomplishment uh, during the age of discovery. There's a myth that Christopher Columbus really believed the world was flat. That is a myth. Just about everyone knew that the world was a sphere, that it was round, it was not flat. Uh, the ancient Greeks knew that. And so Christopher Columbus does not sail west in order to prove that the earth is round. The reason he sails west is because he believes that a shorter route can be found between Europe and what was called the Indies. So going back to this map of po Portuguese exploration, Columbus believed that if he headed out from Spain and rather than go east as the Portuguese had, to get to these islands, which then were called the Indies, named after the local inhabitants, the Indians, uh, connected to the Indian subcontinent, Columbus believed that if he went west, that there would be a shorter, quicker route 
to make it to these islands. So if there's a mistake that Columbus makes, it's not in thinking that the Earth is flat. He knew it wasn't flat. His mistake is he didn't realize just how big the Earth was and that there was not only just one but two continents in the way of his journey east to make it to the Indies. And so Christopher Columbus, even though he is Italian, uh, goes to several courts in Europe in order to get the funding for his idea uh, and for his fleet. No one really wants to back his idea except the king and queen of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella. They believe that there could be great riches to be found if Columbus was able to establish this quicker, shorter route and perhaps discover uh, very profitable additional lands or islands along the way. So, of course, in 1492, Christopher Columbus loads up his three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, and instead of like all those other Portuguese explorers who are heading east, they head west. And they are on this journey for several months, going across the Atlantic Ocean. At one point, there's a grave threat that Columbus's crew is going to mutiny and demand that Columbus turn the ships around and go back home. And just at the point at which they're running out of food and clean, uh, drinking wa drinkable water, uh, and their frustration was reaching a peak, one of the sailors notices some wood in the ocean. And that gives them great motivation and excitement because realizing that there is wood means that there are trees somewhere nearby. And if there are trees, that means land. And so the discovery of that piece of wood gives the sailors and Columbus enough motivation to keep going. And of course, they do continue west. And then they discover land and land on these islands. Now, Columbus is going to land on these islands. He believes that he has succeeded and he has found a shorter route to the Indies. He believes he is where we would call Indonesia today. But he is surprised by the reaction of the natives who don't seem to recognize Europeans. And uh, he was expecting to find something of the Portuguese influence because Portuguese had already traded with those uh, Indonesian islands. And yet he finds none of that. So Columbus is not exactly sure what he has discovered or where he is. Uh, he's greeted by a lot of the local tribes, and some of them seem to have some precious metals among their jewelry. And so immediately he takes some of the locals with him uh, and journeys back to Spain. He declares that he has discovered the Indies or a new land and that these lands are very profitable. And so he is greeted with enthusiasm and in further endorsement from Ferdinand and Isabella, who finance three more trips of Columbus to, of course, what will become the so-called New World. In reality, we believe that Columbus either landed somewhere in the Bahamas or perhaps on the island of Santo Domingo, perhaps what we would call the Dominican Republic today. His additional journeys will travel around the island of Haiti and the island of Santo Domingo and the islands uh, of the Caribbean. He will skirt along the coast of Central and South America. Interesting, Columbus, who makes it into the history books for having discovered America, actually never sets foot on the North American continent. And of course, there is really no America to discover. There's this large landmass of North America and South America connected by Central America. So after four voyages, in some ways, Columbus doesn't even really know what he did discover. Uh, he eventually is going to lose his funding, and he will uh, retire to his native in, uh, Italy uh, in somewhat humiliation and disappointment, uh, believing that he didn't get his cut of uh, the riches that are to be discovered or the fame that was to be his. Of course, what he had discovered is, or what he had really bumped into, what will become two continents. He's actually right in his idea that you can go west to get to the Indies, but it is much, much further than he realized. So crossing a couple thousand miles to get across the Atlantic, 
he more or less bumps into these two very large land masses, uh, which would become North and South America. We call them the Americas because of another uh, Italian cartographer named Amarigo Vespucci. Interesting thing about Amarigo Vespucci, his first name is where we get our word America, is that Amarigo Vespucci actually never journeys to the New World. He uh, speaks with sailors and he uh, sees some of the maps that they have constructed. He draws what is, for the time, the best map of these two land masses. You can see that there's a lot of guessing going on here. But nevertheless, he does draw what we would somewhat identify as North and South America. And so uh, he's most significant for his namesake of lending his name to these new continents in America. So with Columbus's discovery, it leads to Spain's large-scale investment into these two continents, these two new worlds, and this leads to the arrival of the conquistadors. The conquistadors were Spanish soldiers, a military force, who are going to encounter the natives in North and South America and bring these lands under the subjugation of the Spanish crown, often through violence or disease or trade. Some of the more famous conquistadors include Vasco Nunez de Balboa. Balboa uh, brings several ships across the Atlantic, lands on the coast of what we would identify uh, as Panama, and the Panama uh, Isthmus, this very, very narrow neck of land, that connects North and South America. Uh, he lands his ships and then crosses the Isthmus and then is given credit as being the first European to discover or view the Pacific Ocean. He felt that the this other ocean he has now discovered, in contrast with the Atlantic, was very calm or Pacific, and therefore it gets its name of the Pacific Ocean. Ferdinand Magellan is also an important uh, Spanish sea captain who uh, is funded by the Spanish crown and launches a large fleet that sails not only to the New World, but goes down the east coast of Cent uh, South America, goes through what will become known as the Straits of Magellan, and then continues west. He too believes that the journey to what we call Indonesia and the South Pacific is a lot shorter than it is. He continues west, goes all the way several thousand miles across the Pacific uh, Ocean, and indeed does land in what we call the Philippines today. However, the Spanish uh, get into conflict with the local uh, Filipinos there, and Magellan is killed with a poison dart in the Philippines. His crew mounts up, and they continue the journey with uh, now the dead body of their captain, Magellan, cross the Indian Ocean, round the Cape of Good Hope, head up the west coast of Africa, and return to Spain. That makes Ferdinand Magellan the first individual to circumnavigate the entire world. Another important Spanish conquistador is Hernando Cortes. Hernando Cortes may be the most famous Spanish conquistador. He is also funded by the Spanish crown and brings a fleet of ships across the Atlantic and he is going to land uh, roughly what we would call the Yucatan Peninsula today and the first order he gives once he lands is for his men to burn the ships. And so now with no ships, no ability to retreat to Spain, the men are forced to march all the way into the interior, what we would call Mexico today but what he calls New Spain, and what he encounters in his effort to colonize this area for Spain is, of course, the very large Aztec Empire, a very large population with some developed cities, including their capital of Tenochtitlan, um, uh, and uh, several different pyramid structures. And uh, this is the task, or this is the enemy for Cortes in his effort to colonize uh, this area, what we would call Mexico, uh, for Spain. And so even though the Spanish are vastly outnumbered, they encounter the Aztec forces and inflict a great slaughter on the Aztec armies. 
to some extent through disease, but also in large part because of superior weapons uh, and gunpowder and disorganization among uh, the Aztec military ranks. Uh, some of the remnants of the pyramids in uh, around Tenochtitlan, what we today call Mexico City, still remain. This is me on top of one of the pyramids a number of years ago. A lot of these pyramids were used for religious purposes. The Aztecs were not averse to practicing human sacrifice. In fact, frequently, when there was a drought and the Aztecs priests wanted to pray for rain, they would line up men, women, and children and march them to the top of their pyramids where their hearts could be ripped out uh, and where they could be beheaded stabbed uh, as the ch women and children are marching to their death up the pyramids and they would begin to cry, the priests believed that that was proof that the rain was going to begin. And so uh, archaeologists have found thousands upon thousands of human skeletons who are victims of human sacrifice uh, in and around these temples near Tenochtitlan. Here is one of the gods uh, that uh, was worshipped um, and designed to hold the hearts of sacrificial victims among the Aztecs. So Cortes is successful in subjecting and destroying the Aztec Empire, thus securing what we call Mexico today as a colony for Spain that he, he names New Spain. He, of course, encounters the very famous Aztec king, Montezuma, uh, who will become his prisoner and directs Cortes to a lot of the precious metals in the area, uh, some gold, but particularly a lot of silver. We can also mention that a little further south in what we call South America today was the very large Incan Empire, more in the mountains of what is contemporarily Peru uh, and into Ecuador. And is the Spanish conquistador Francisco Pizarro, who brings a large force into this area, conquers the Incas, uh, and subjects their population to Spain. He uses a lot of the population in order to go into the local mines and mountains and uh, mine silver for the Spanish crown. So a lot of these natives uh, live and work under very harsh condition under Spanish or Portuguese authority, and they're mining silver out of the mountains and loading this silver onto mule trains, and the mules bring the silver down the mountains and then across the coast over to Spanish caravel or galleons, loaded onto the ships, and then the ships have to make it all the way across the Atlantic, hopefully making it back to Spain. Uh, another significant discoverer and venture in the New World is Juan Ponce de Leon, uh, Ponce de Leon is one of the few French explorers that partake in the age of exploration, and he is looking to increase possessions and establish some colonies for France in the New World. The area that Ponce de Leon is most familiar and most acquainted with discovering is, of course, the peninsula that juts down from the base of North America, which upon landing his fleet there, in 1513, in offloading, Ponce de Leon is struck by the beauty of the land, the beauty of the beaches, and particularly the flowers along the beaches, and therefore names it Florida, or Florida, uh, and claims it as a Spanish possession. Ponce de Leon is going to conduct uh, a lot of exploration, particularly around the Florida Peninsula and throughout the Caribbean, is actually going to venture into Florida very little. Uh, but this is significant because eventually it brings European attention to uh, F Florida. And this will include um, the myth of the Fountain of Youth. It is unclear whether or not Ponce de Leon was actually interested uh, in discovering the Fountain of Youth. But there is. This is one of those fantastical land stories, one of these myths about these uncharted lands that there is a a fountain out there in the new world that if old people got into the fountain, it would renew them to vigor and restore their youth. So with Spanish settlement of the Floridian Peninsula, we have the establishment of the oldest 
city in North America, the oldest city still in continuous existence, and this is, of course, St. Augustine, Florida, established in 1565. That is over 200 years before the establishment of the United States. So St. Augustine is a very old, established Spanish city. So with the Portuguese exploring the east, the far east, around Africa, India, and all the way to what we call Indonesia today, and the Spanish looking more to the west, particularly Central and South America and the Caribbean, uh, the Pope decides to intervene between these two competing powers and actually divides up the world between them draws a line in 1493 initially, and then updates it, moves it slightly to the west in 1494. This is the Treaty of Tordesillas. The Treaty of Tordesillas essentially divides the world between Spain and Portugal, courtesy of the Pope. Now, throughout New Spain, the Spanish conquistadors are setting up these large encomiendas. An encomienda, in some ways, is a plantation system uh, it involves a system of subjugating the local Indians and making them work uh, on this system and on these large um, sugar plantations, tobacco plantations, uh, perhaps mines as well. And it represents the first attempt, particularly, of using local natives and subjugating people in order to uh, extract, extract the natural resources, and particularly agricultural products, from the New World. Everywhere that the Spanish conquistadors go, usually Jesuit missionaries and Spanish priests go with them. And so, in very far and remote areas, Jesuits and Catholic priests are setting up missions. And of course, this is one of the purposes of the Age of Exploration, to convert the natives uh, particularly to Roman Catholicism. The 16th century is also the century of the Protestant Reformation in Europe, as Europe is being torn apart by religious conflict and division between Protestants and Catholics. And therefore, the Catholics are interested in getting to the New World, establishing missions, and converting the local populations to Roman Catholicism before the Protestants can get there. And they go to very remote areas where there is very little European settlement. Uh, areas in uh, the south of what we would call Texas today and set up a mission there called Bear Alamo, uh, Bejar Alamo, which is the, of course, the Alamo, uh, corrected, uh, constructed to honor uh, St. Anthony, and so the settlement becomes known as San Antonio, and then other Spanish missions as well in places uh, to honor other saints such as San Diego, and San Francisco to honor St. Francis, uh, and then also Los Angeles, the City of Angels, will also be created on the coast of North America, what will become California, in order um, to convert the local population as well. The English are rather quite late in getting into the adventure of exploration of the New World. Uh, the English, of course, are looking to settle the question of religion uh, and the instability of the Tudor monarchy and establishing the Anglican Church uh, in England often distracts the English from what is going on in the New World. But during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, she eventually sends one of her most capable sea captains with a small fleet, Sir Francis Drake, to discover new lands for England, bring back profits, often at the expense of Spain. So Sir Francis Drake sets out from England, goes due south along the coast of Africa, crosses the Atlantic, and then goes down the east coast of South Africa, South America, and then through the Straits of Magellan, and then up the west coast of South America, all the way up to the west coast of North America. He was the first to do so. He lands on the coast of North America, the west coast of North America, and discovers a local tribe that had a queen, the queen's name was Queen California, and names the land California. Drake and his men are worshipped as gods. They had never been seen, uh, the locals had never seen white men before. So Drake and his men depart. They head due west across the Pacific Ocean. They also uh, journey near the Philippines and then through 
what will now become known as the East Indies or Indonesia, cross the Indian Ocean around the Cape of Good Hope and go, go up the west side of Africa, returning to England. Therefore, Drake is the first sea captain to actually make it all the way around the world, to circumnavigate the world. Magellan's crew was the first to circumnavigate the world, but of course Magellan was killed along the way. So Francis Drake is the first sea captain to successfully circumnavigate the world. Uh, this journey of Drake eventually will inspire other English explorers and then into the 17th century, the 1600s, you will see widespread colonization of North America by the English and, of course, the formation of the 13 colonies on the mainland of North America. So with the establishment of colonies and the encomienda system and gra the gradual increase of settlements in South America, the Caribbean, Central America, and eventually the English in North America, we can speak of a trade system that is conducted between the three main continents uh, that surround the Atlantic Ocean. This is known as the triangle trade, obviously, for its triangle configuration. So how the triangle trade system worked is basically slave traders would descend on the African continent and buy African slaves and ship them to the New World, to North and South America, for them to work in plantations and mines and fields and rice fields and particularly, eventually, plantations. Those slaves would work in North America in order to produce uh, and extract raw materials such as sugar, tobacco, and cotton, which are all grown in the New World. There's a huge demand for these products in Europe, and so other traders would ship them back to Europe, and in Europe, these raw uh, materials would be refined and produced into textiles or rum or manufactured goods that could be sold in Africa or in the New World. It's a triangle trade uh, between these three points. So we ought to talk about a key uh, piece of the triangle trade, which is, of course, the slave trade. A lot of Europeans uh, who bought and sold slaves, slavers, did not have to journey into the interior of Africa in order to enslave other Africans. African tribes were historically at war with each other, particularly in West Africa, enslaving each other. And so Europeans generally journey along the coast and they purchase African slaves who had been enslaved by other Africans uh, and bring them to the New World. Uh, it is possible that one important point of departure for slaves from Africa was at Gore Island, which is uh, right off the coast of Dakar, uh, Senegal. It is unclear if this was actually a uh, debarkment point for slaves or not to the New World. There's some historical question about that. But in any case, Gore Island represents something of different trading spots that definitely did exist along the western coast of Africa, in which slaves were bought and sold uh, from Africans to Europeans and then conducted their long, horrendous journey to the New World across the Atlantic Ocean, which we call the Middle Passage. So as a result, a lot of African Americans today in the United States, if they are able to trace their ancestry, there's a good chance that many of them have roots in what we would call Western Africa today in a lot of these small countries. Because this is where a lot of the slaves were uh, captured and then sold to Europeans and then took this horrendous passage called the Middle Passage because, of course, it's in the middle between uh, these the Old World and the New World. And slaves were overcrowded, often completely naked, uh, sick, starving, horrifically whipped and abused uh, as they made their journey all the way to the New World. Uh, Olada Equiano provided us one of the best accounts of exactly how horrific uh, the Middle Passage was. And this is how most slaves made it to the New World. So, with the arrival of slaves and the production of raw materials um, in the New World, there develops an exchange, what we call the Columbian Exchange, between the Old World and the New. The Old World gives the New World a lot of things. The New World gives the Old World a lot of things. So, for example, from Europe and Africa and Asia that had brought to the Americas for the first time, 
Wonderful things like the coffee bean and peach, olives, bananas, onions, grapes, turnips, and domesticated cattle, sheep, pigs, and horses, and various grains, and the honeybee. The positive things that are sent from the New World, from North America in large part, tobacco, quinine, sweet potato, avocados, peppers, peanuts, potatoes, tomatoes, corn, beans, vanilla, turkeys, pumpkins, pineapples, squash. However, there's also a negative element to the Columbian Exchange in which diseases uh, from the old world are introduced uh, to the new world, such as smallpox, influenza, typhus, measles, malaria, diphtheria, and whooping cough. And probably the primary disease introduced from the new world to the old world would be the sexually transmitted disease of syphilis, which uh, explorers contract, sailors contract, and then pass on to prostitutes, particularly in uh, port cities in Europe, and then make their way into the general population. The number one killer of native populations in the New World, North and South America, far more than the conquistadors or European armies, is definitely smallpox. Europeans had been exposed to smallpox for many centuries before, and it would seem that they had developed something of an immunity to uh, the worst of the disease. Uh, but the natives have not. And so when Europeans encounter native populations in North and South America, unwittingly, unknowingly, they infect them with smallpox. There, of course, is no cure for this, and smallpox proves absolutely devastating. It's impossible to know the exact numbers of natives who are killed by smallpox up and down North and South America, uh, but it's well past the hundreds of thousands. We're, tra we're talking millions of people who are killed by smallpox. Remember that there is no germ theory of disease at this point in history. Europeans have no concept that the blankets that they may be sharing with natives could be uh, infected with smallpox, that uh, when they cough and sneeze, they may be also passing on the pox. Uh, they have no knowledge of this, and so often unknowingly, it's Europeans infecting uh, local native tribes uh, with this absolutely devastating disease. The smallpox epidemic that infects the New World becomes the basis of a piece of English propaganda against the Spanish. Of course, the English are somewhat jealous of the Spanish Empire they have uh, created in the New World and are looking to expand their own dominions and colonies in the New World. And so it's the English that really promote this legend called the Black Legend. The Black Legend uh, exaggerates the atrocities and the death rate of, that the Spanish inflicted on local populations. To be sure, the Spanish conquistadors did enslave, horribly abuse, often kill local natives. And uh, with the introduction of smallpox, it did lead to millions of deaths. But the English take this as a piece of propaganda, exaggerate it even further, ascribe very malicious motives to the Spanish conquistadors that they intended to kill millions of people, and also promote stories about them eating the children of natives, uh, and these stories of mass rape uh, and feeding native children to dogs, uh, cannibalism stories, and so forth, which of course were exaggerations and not true, but an important piece of English propaganda. So this entire system of creating colonies and trading spots and particularly extracting raw materials, whether it be precious metals or agricultural goods from the New World, becomes a larger part of this new economic model of the 16th century known as mercantilism. So we can think of mercantilism as a break, a rupture from small local medieval uh, self-sufficient, self-sustaining economies. During the Middle Ages, most people live with a very local economy, you grew your own food, you ate your own food, and maybe you traded very locally. Mercantilism represents uh, the first at attempt at global trade, you might think of it that way, uh, and the establishment of colonies 
and it's based on a couple presuppositions, including the idea that wealth is measured by how much gold and silver you have. And so how much a nation or a king could accumulate of precious metals, specie, hard money, that would represent how wealthy they are. And if they have colonies supporting the mother country, this is what it means to be a prosperous country. Okay, And of course, uh, we will see uh, the rejection of mercantilist thinking about 100 years later with the arrival of the French physiocrats and uh, the uh, introduction of capitalism, particularly through the writings of Adam Smith. With the extraction of so many precious metals, gold and silver, from uh, particularly South America and arriving in Europe, it leads to what the introduction of a lot of money always leads to, which is inflation. So historians have identified in the 16th century what they have called a price revolution, in which prices, particularly in Spain, skyrocket. It leads to massive inflation uh, because of the introduction of so much silver. There's more money, therefore prices, uh, merchants can charge more, and then prices rise as the result. The English have a little bit different of a model, and they experiment with some early forms of what we might call commercial capitalism in which investors would come together and invest their resources, purchase a ship or a small fleet of ships, and pay some sailors to go to the New World, create a colony, extract some raw materials, and generate a profit. These were called joint stock companies. Jointly, together, investors would come together and buy stock or a piece of a company. Therefore, if the company, the colony it creates, and the materials that it's able to produce or find, generates a profit, the stockholders would get a profit. If the ships, of course, sink in the Atlantic, or the colony is a failure, then your losses are also minimized because of how much stock you had purchased in the company. So with the English, we start to see the formation of early commercial capitalism. You see that on a larger scale with the formation of the British East India Company. This is a royal company created by the Crown of England to conduct trade and financing, particularly uh, on the Indian subcontinent. And so gradually, the British will exercise more influence over the Indian subcontinent and eventually push out the Portuguese with India becoming a very key uh, colony in the emerging British Empire. You see this also a bit foreshadowings of a more commercial system, uh, a more capitalistic system with the creation of central banking systems, particularly with the Dutch Republic and uh, their attempt to create colonies, and they form the first Bank of Amsterdam, which is going to monitor the nation's finances uh, and prices and keep money fluid and keep a lot of money into the system. So with the emergence of more precious metals and of colonies and larger empires, the end of religious wars and the introduction of early commercial capitalism, you also see more advanced banking, such as the, the Fugger, banking house uh, formed by Jacob Fugger, whereas the Medicis are famous for their banking system and being the bankers of the Pope uh, along the Italian peninsula in the 15th century. The Fugers become the primary bankers, particularly in the north um, uh, and along the Baltic Sea, and they are providing the financing for a lot of these explorations to the new world, which of course will lead to the creation of additional colonies as well.